Welcome to the FeeCast, your weekly dose of economic thinking from your friends at the Foundation for Economic Education. I am Richard Lawrence, and I am back from my summer vacation. Happy to see our panel, Anna Jane Peril, Dan Sanchez, and Marianne March. And it's the end of summer, which means that I just returned from the beach. I try to get in there right when no one else is there. You look excessively tan. Uh, I got very sunburnt, but only on my legs, so you can't tell. I was very cautious (laughs) given this... uh, pale skin that I have. But I did do something brand new on my vacation, and that is I fished, and I actually caught three fish, one of which was edible. And so I'm coming back victorious from from this vacation. Thank you to Sean, our executive producer, who filled in for me last week. It seemed like you guys had a great conversation. Um, But this week, of course, given the fact that we're winding down with summer, we're thinking about the fact that for some people, it's time to go back to school. And for many people, that means the beginning of their college careers. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these folks are going because they have goals that they only believe can be achieved through a college degree. Some people might be going because they think it's what they have to do. And other people might be going because their parents told them that they should go. Or because it's a party. And and because it's a party uh, at some places, right? Um, So... As we're talking about returning to college, you're starting to get news in the internet of various large companies that are beginning Mm -hmm. to say, formally now, that they are relaxing their requirement for a college degree for job applicants, which isn't exactly new, but they're making a big deal out of it. Yeah, that's right. Google, Apple, IBM. And then I saw a news article earlier that other companies like Bank of America and places like Costco, a bunch of places are relaxing their requirements. And it's not all about the piece of paper anymore for a lot of these places. Which I feel like when you hear this, I I, I never really thought it was that big a deal because I don't really think about a specific, I guess I just don't, I assume that great companies are out there hiring great employees, right, right. regardless of a very specifically mm-hmm. a degree. Um, so it surprises me to hear that this is, um, I guess, a formal statement that they're making to the public, which is this is no longer important to us. Yeah, we have um, an article on the site, uh, college degree requirements were never as real as you thought. Oh, by, I love a scare quote. By, <laughs> by Derek McGill. And and he, he makes that point that even though it was, you know, technically a checkbox on mm-hmm. on the form that it was very much a negotiable checkbox mm-hmm. and um, and that a lot of people treated it as non-negotiable and that's just a, a mistake because really what they are going for is not the college degree itself but the the value creation ability that it signals that it may mm-hmm. signal but if you can signal it in other ways that's really what they care about. Yeah, and I think that that might even be the difference that we're seeing or kind of the evolution that we're seeing is that nowadays, I mean, college degrees were kind of one of the only ways back before the internet. Right. Um, I mean, the your college degree was one of the few ways you could kind of signal your your value and how you've achieved this goal. You could prove that you were serious yeah. about actually mm-hmm. setting your mind toward a goal exactly. and seeing it all the way through. Yeah, mm-hmm. and that you have, I mean, I guess there are different, we'll get into kind of the different purposes of what that means, the degree, but um, I think that now, especially with just access to communication, um, how easy it is to, I guess, just access information now, it's way easier to show, just demonstrate your work, demonstrate your work in a way mm-hmm. that I think is freeing for people. Um, it definitely is for us. It's much easier to see people's work experience and actually um, validate kind of what they're or, or confirm what they've done um, from a hiring standpoint now with the internet. And AJ, um, you actually do hire at Fee. Yeah. And you were telling us before we started here that you actually don't necessarily look at the college degree as the end-all be-all for applicants. Yeah, especially in the work that we do um, in fees in-person programs. Um, we just, I, I know that I know the kind of work we're looking for, and a degree is really, really important. Obviously, we care about economics, we care about philosophy, we care about politics, um, but I think that ultimately we really, we look for people that have proven that they work hard. Um, and I think that it also speaks to, so when I, I guess when we hire people, we also look at, I think it's really cool, and I actually prioritize people who are um, who may have done something like a gap year, and by that I mean didn't immediately go to college, right, didn't right. immediately go into college right after um, after high school, because I think that that to me represents that they are they 
thought about their the intention yeah. of their future um, and that they actually have experience in the real world. And for a young person, that's so hard to find. Didn't mm-hmm. you? You took a gap year. I took three or four gap years. <laughs> yeah. And I'm really glad that I did. Immediately after graduating high school by the skin of my teeth, I might add, I started taking a couple classes at a local community school and I was just slipping into my habits of not going to class and skipping to maybe go to a party or something. And so That's I stopped. twice now that you've mentioned parties <laughs> on this feed. Well, it's we're talking about college, aren't we? Um, <laughs> so I decided to stop enrolling and I was working. I was working in retail and I had a whole a whole life in those three or four years. A lot of experience and a lot of fun, I might add. And then after a couple of years of being out in the world, I figured out what I was interested in, which was politics and economics. And as soon as I figured that out, I did a little bit of research and I found out that public policy as a degree had a low, a, a relatively low unemployment rate. And so I was like, oh, done. I'll study that. And I went back to school. And in my experience, I found that people who take a gap year or two or three um, also get a lot of value out of college, a lot more value mm-hmm. than other people mm-hmm. do because they yeah. know exactly what they, they're going for. They, they're really trying to extract as much value from the college experience. There's more intentionality to me in in the gap year, I guess, um, approach is that you know why you're doing what you're doing. You actually have to think about it. You have to think about what goals you're trying to achieve Mm -hmm. as as an adult in the future. Um, And I I wish more young people took gap years. I wish that it was more socially acceptable to to take that time. I think it is becoming more socially acceptable, right? Because, I mean, just like Marianne was explaining, Mm -hmm. you know, people are choosing to do this now because they see their friends, they see their relatives, they see other people who are we're taking the opportunity not to go directly into right. the next stage yeah. of life, right? Well, at the time, it was the height of the recession. And so I had a lot of friends who were graduating from high school and they weren't finding jobs. They were getting their degrees and then they were like, okay, well, I guess I'll go work a customer service job. And I should clarify, you know, when I said going into the next stage of life, it's almost as if there's a path that everyone has that is identical for each person. Mm-hmm, it's almost mm-hmm. like the game of life, you know, yeah. that was probably mm-hmm. made sometime in the 40s or the 50s. Mm-hmm. And it was like, you know, graduate from high school, yes. get married or go to college, get mm-hmm. a job, retire at 55. Yeah. Yep. And, yeah. you know, then being in your grave by the time you're 62. <laughs> and, yeah. And in the game so of life, it's too. just one path. One it's like one it's, path that yeah. everyone goes on. But now yeah. we're Conveyor discovering belt. that it, it, exactly it's not a conveyor belt. There are mm-hmm. just so many more opportunities now with the internet where you can actually not only learn, but you can demonstrate through mm-hmm. web projects or putting your portfolio online or or doing other types of projects that are so much more visible to potential employers. The possibilities are so much different than before mm-hmm. where all you had was either a piece of paper in a frame above your desk, if you had a desk, a diploma, mm-hmm. and a resume. It's so much different than it was. And our education... Uh, entrepreneurship education director T.K. Coleman, when we we had him on the podcast, he talked a lot about the different ways that you can signal, especially like Anna Jane, you were mentioning that with the internet, it's so much easier to, you know, it's not just artists who have portfolios now. Like, all sorts of professionals can mm-hmm. have portfolios. Yeah, when I when I applied to fee, I mean, I'm a program manager and I had a website. And, mm-hmm. that's, and that's a really cool way to show, yeah, what you can do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, you know, of course... People choose not to go to college for good reasons and bad reasons, mm-hmm. both. But one of the best reasons, in my opinion, is to begin your career right now. And we've actually had an article about that recently on our website, talking about not waiting four years, but actually just jumping into work life right after high school. Right, right. Yeah, because really it's a matter of getting your foot in the door, and there's lots of ways to do that. And so, and it's not just putting out a, uh, a signal in. Uh, into the in general but it's about signaling to particular candidates uh, particular business partners that you want to work with Mm -hmm. so you can offer a value proposition you can offer to work for free you can say hey i noticed Mm -hmm. your facebook presence is is a little bit minimal and i i I could build that out for you i can help you i can actually do something our friends at praxis uh, Mm -hmm. for whom tk coleman also works Mm -hmm. he's a co-founder and derek mcgill who wrote the piece that dan mentioned earlier Mm -hmm. um they talk about actually demonstrating for no charge that you can actually add value to an employer that you want to work mm-hmm. for. A That's potential how employer. I got my foot in the door here at Fee. I started off by volunteering and then I did a couple of internships and then I never left and you guys never noticed. <laughs> and <laughs> you're all, still here. Yeah. <laughs> all, all of this is based right on, on what, <laughs> what uh, economist Brian Kaplan calls the signaling model of higher education. So there's just basically a debate. There's 
there's the signaling model, which we, we've been talking about, and versus mm-hmm. the human capital model, where a lot of people think that what higher education really is about is the, the, you know, the skills and the expertise. The and raw the, education the, you get in the classroom. Right, right. Um, but, but there's an argument that it really it is about signaling. And Let's take a step back real yeah. quick, because that's kind of a word we use sometimes in the colloquium in our mm-hmm. daily lives, but we don't necessarily use it in the way maybe that you're describing it, Dan. What do you mean exactly by signaling? Um, so he, he gives an analogy. He says, there's two ways to raise the value of a diamond. One of them is you get an expert gemsmith to cut the diamond perfectly to make it a wonderful diamond. That adds value by making the stone objectively better, like human capital in the education context. The other way, you get a guy with an eyepiece to look at it and go, oh, yeah, yeah, this is great. It's wonderful, flawless. Then he puts a little sticker on it saying AAA diamond. That's signaling. The jewel is the same, but it's certified. So it's a, the certification that you have value. Yes. Well, I see. I feel like that's a little bit, I mean, perhaps I'm wrong in misunderstanding what the signaling, I guess, the signaling model is. But it, that's a, to me, that's a little reductionist because I think that signaling, it is important. I, when I think signaling, especially in the education sense, I think this is signaling to an employer or to an individual that the person who earned that degree achieved a goal. That's what signaling means to me is that they mm. achieved a goal. Mm-hmm. So it's still signaling something. It's, it's signaling that you achieved a goal, not necessarily that you improved your human capital. Does That's, that make sense? Yes. And I think there's something to that, that mm-hmm. like dropping out of college versus actually sticking to it and, mm-hmm. and finishing it, you know, that, that shows how much stick to someone has and, and how much diligence they have and patience and discipline. And so, so there's definitely something to that. But is that uh, as valuable as st- sticking to an actual work, uh, an actual marketplace type project mm-hmm. where you're actually serving customers uh, and trying to satisfy customers, or including the customer of a boss. And uh, arguably, that's more important. So I, I often have a, a, an example, a thought experiment. So like you could think of college as an obstacle course. Now imagine that you are a baseball manager of a team in, in major leagues. And for some reason, all of the candidates for your team, they've never actually played baseball. Hmm. They've only actually done obstacle courses. Um, now, some people do better at obstacle courses. Uh, some, some people get through them really fast. Uh, some people are, um, are really bad at them or really slow. Or some people give up. <laughs> and, um, and so if that's all you had to go on, of course, who would you choose? You would choose the, the people, people that did the obstacle course the fastest and the yeah. strongest. Yeah. yeah. But that doesn't mean that the obstacle course is the best preparation right. for right. becoming mm-hmm. a baseball and player. And that opens up the mention of another concept called sunk cost fallacy, mm-hmm. which is maybe you've started college, maybe you've started the obstacle course to go along with your analogy, and you realize at some later point, maybe halfway through, three quarters of the way through, 90% of the way through, it's no longer going to be the best way for you to achieve your goals. Is it good for you to say, well, I've gotten this far, I might as well continue? Yes. Or is it appropriate for then you, you to say, well, you know, I did get 70 way, 70% of the way mm-hmm. in, but it's not actually productive for me to mm-hmm. continue this. I should begin my career, or, you know, do the other thing that, that I need to do valuably. And it's okay then to say, you know, I put this much into it, time to go. Yeah. And it also gives you an insight into the think thought process of hirers like Google and Apple and why before that they had those check boxes because mm-hmm. it's just an easy filtering mechanism. Mm-hmm. It's like, okay, well, for whatever reason, everybody's just doing the obstacle course at, at this age. And so, well, it's just easier. It just filters out as many people as possible if we just say like, okay, you have to have actually finished the obstacle course and, and had a certain kind of time on it in order to, for us to even consider right. you. Right. But if some people buck the trend and didn't listen to the, the, the gospel that everyone has to go to the obstacle course that everyone has to do college and and actually played baseball uh during during that time and you showed them like look i've actually played the thing that you want right yeah then then you're gonna give them a chance of course and in reality i think that there is kind of a commitment on the part of the uh manager the baseball manager in this analogy being like an employer for example they put in more time trying to find that person right because the obstacle Mm -hmm. course is kind of a preset something you can just check off a box. Yes. And so the, I guess the, um, the input that you're making as a manager or a, an employer um, is that you are, you're taking more time to find that person, but in reality might end up with a, with a higher quality employee, mm-hmm. right? Or mm-hmm. baseball player. Mm-hmm. Well, and so 
college isn't all that bad, right? There are <laughs> reasons for it to exist, and there are sure. reasons for people to go through college and finish it, right? Not only to mm-hmm. show they ha- they're tenacious, right, but also that they did it for a particular valuable reason. Each one of us mm-hmm. went to college. Mm-hmm. Uh, I personally believe my time in college was spent well. So there are mm-hmm. valuable things yeah. with college. Sure, there's a lot of reasons to go. There's the signaling aspect, the getting the degree. Maybe you want to pursue medicine or something like that, in which case I'm fine with you going to college. But You don't want a college dropout <laughs> treating your, your burns? That seems to, to speak to me more to the human capital argument. Mm-hmm. I mean, maybe that's not, it doesn't quite fit, but the idea that like medical school, for example, that is like, you do have to go to medical school to learn things there about bones skills. and yeah, yeah. to learn how to put a needle in like right. that, that's, uh, that is important. Well, so even yeah. then, like, how do we know? Cause part of it is government intervention that mm-hmm. there's uh, government backed cartels, <laughs> Uh, with with med, uh, medical school and law school that are involved. Mm-hmm. And, and you have to wonder, like, okay, is it the proper balance of classroom time versus actual experiment, experience? Mm-hmm. Like, would, would these people, as opposed to reading about setting bones in a classroom, like actually mm-hmm. apprenticing with, mm-hmm. with doctors earlier on, you know, would, would those be more trustworthy? It's and, the way it used to be. When mm-hmm. you look at various uh, historical accounts of individuals, uh, for instance, people in colonial era of the United States, in many cases it said that they read law. And when it said that they read law, it didn't necessarily mean that they went to a law school yeah. because that was probably not only exceptional at the, at the time, but maybe unheard of. But they actually apprenticed for a lawyer who taught mm-hmm. them the ropes, right? Mm-hmm. They probably yeah. apprenticed for doctors who taught them how to set bones, how to mm-hmm. do other things. So this notion of institutionalized education is fairly but new think, for many careers. I think people would argue that I don't want I don't want someone who apprenticed under a specific doctor to be my doctor, I want to know he went to Johns Hopkins, right, and got this specific degree because is that been better there. than learning from John Hobbs Hopkins <laughs> himself? <laughs> yeah, that's, but that's the thing is, um, I think that there, it takes a lot more. It puts a lot more of the, and this could be good or bad. It puts a lot more of the onus um, on the consumer of that medical good yeah. or service to pursue that, pursue some sort of quality check on well, that. Right. I, I think there's also a crowding out effect too, because like to the extent that we have these government backed. Uh, um, credentialing systems that it prevents the rights of private credentialing mm-hmm. systems mm-hmm. that that would take some of that burden off of the consumer. Yeah. Well, and the fact that someone's employed for instance by Emory University Hospital is also a credential in and of itself, right? right? And so how did they go through the hiring process? Mm-hmm. Did they necessarily need to have mm-hmm. an MD in order to get that job? Yeah. Well, the other reality is we're not all going to school to be doctors. People are going to school to study things that they don't necessarily have to spend a lot of money on a four-year education for. But th- we we're talking about the other reasons. There are there are plenty of reasons. I personally was able to remake myself in a way. College was a fresh start for me to leave my bad habits from high school behind. And like I mentioned, I barely, I barely graduated from high school, but I was a 4.0 student in college because I cared and I had that opportunity to start fresh and I was surrounded by study abroad and you got to participate in like the fun for American studies, like really cool things. So my my question is that as compared Mm. to high school, that was better because there was more independence. Oh yeah. But, (laughs) but what if, what if you had even more and more independence Mm -hmm. where you were just went into the market, like it Mm -hmm. would have been less gradated of a transition, but may, but would the greater independence earlier been an even greater benefit for you to spread your wings? It's it's entirely possible. I hated high school, I, which is why I was such a bad student, is that I skipped a lot. And I ha- if I'd had the opportunity to study what I was interested in earlier, then yeah, it might have been a shift earlier on. Mm-hmm. And so we're talking about the independence associated mm-hmm. with college over high school. But what are some of the other benefits? Well, I think independence is also an important thing to talk about when it comes to young people. Um, when you're talking about people whose frontal lobes have not closed, you've got like really, I think you've got almost, I mean, the risks are really high for success and failure. And so I think that some people per- perceive college, and this could be again, right or wrong, but perceive it as almost like a keeping a keeping pen for your young person until they become fully formed. Sort of the um, green room before the show of adult. Yes. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's very, to me, it's like the consequences. I mean, they are, they are um, meaningful, but the consequences are lower, right, to failure. But I I wonder if the cause and effect is reversed here, because I wonder if why we 
feel that these holding pens are even beneficial mm. is because we've sort of kept them um, in a prolonged adolescent period. Oh, well, that's for sure. I, I, yeah. I, I kind of think of it as sort of like a... Um, a, a coddling sort of uh, vicious spiral. It's like that a lot of parents use the very, uh, their immaturity as an excuse. Well, they're, they're mm -hmm. not ready to have responsibility, so they don't give them responsibility, but that's exactly what makes them yeah. irresponsible in the first place. Yeah. I mean, yeah, the idea my dad said when I graduated college, he was like, I'm not paying for anything. You go out and he's like, you got to earn your like every everything. He was like, you're it's all you. You are out in the world. Put me out to the wolves. And I think that that alone <laughs> pushed me to, yeah, just do everything by the age of 22. Have, you know, full time job, all that stuff, insurance, car, blah, blah, blah. And it's mm -hmm. I, I think that it is kind of the idea that you just you give someone their independence. I do yeah. think that's important. Swim. But I don't know. I don't know how that works for everyone, but I guess that's a greater question. It, your right? mileage varies, right? Yeah. And I think another benefit mm -hmm. of college, for me at least, and any, any other educational programs that I've undertaken, has been the networking, the social yeah. capital yeah. that mm -hmm. I've built. And so hopefully in a maybe ideal sense or maybe even a normal sense, when you go to a, a college program, you meet people who then you are not thrown out to the wolves. You actually do have a network of people mm -hmm. who you can talk to, mm -hmm. who can reference you, who can you know help you be introduced to other people. That's mm -hmm. valuable. Right. And there are a few places that you can get that. College is, is a good one. It's and a very good one. One limitation of the networking in college is the fact that everyone is so similar in age. And that's exactly the least... Uh, likely person that you can benefit from in terms of networking is someone who's exactly at the same per period of life as mm -hmm. stage of life as you are, because you, what have you to offer? Not like, as much to exchange because you're sort of at the same level. Right. Right. Whereas with, with someone with an older and a younger uh, pe person meet, meeting each other, mm -hmm. you know, there's the, uh, the older person can help the younger person by giving them opportunities and the younger person can help the older person by giving them leadership experience. Yeah. But you're not only talking in the network to the person in your class, you're also talking to the people they know. So there's yes. that benefit as well. Mm -hmm. So well, obviously in college, aside from sort of the missed time that you have from not mm -hmm. launching your career, um, which we'll talk about, there are a lot of different considerations around cost. And this is actually a mm -hmm. big problem in our politics today and society is the amount of student loan debt that households have. And this is yeah. becoming a bigger and bigger proportion of the amount of debt uh, that is held by individuals. That's right. 43 million Americans hold student loan debt to the tune of one... Let's see, where is it? $1.5 trillion. A trillion and a half. Mm -hmm. That's an average of $37,000 for the average graduate from year 2016, which was the year I graduated. And I'll tell you, that number is about right. <laughs> it, it really does prompt the question, when you look at the costs versus the benefits, is college worth it? Yeah, because we talk a lot about the value of entrepreneurship. And we have an article by Zach Slayback that talks about how that burden of debt really uh, puts a damper on entrepreneurship because it makes you less likely to to want to take chances mm -hmm. in in your mm -hmm. career. Right. It's like you 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 can't like start start your own business when you have that kind of burden. It's like you've got if you especially if you went to law school, you just got to become a lawyer yeah. right away. Like you've got to get into the right. the, mm -hmm. the traditional well, profession back, that you trained pay for. Pay back your student loans and in mm -hmm. most cases student loans will not be forgiven if you file for bankruptcy. So you might be saddled with that debt. Some people, it's to the tune of $100,000, and that's for life. It's not going away right. unless you pay it. So right. you're saying it's contributing to risk aversion, which is actually contributing to, like, a lack of innovation. Yes. Well, that's an issue. Yeah. I've never thought about that way. So I think the debt has to be – we have to go – we have to talk about the other side of the coin, though, in that college graduates compared to high school graduates – are more likely to make money. According to the Social Security Administration, men with bachelor's degrees earn approximately $900,000 more based on median lifetime earnings than their high school counterparts. And for women, it's a difference of about uh, $630,000. And that's that's not jump change. Mm -mm. That's a lot and of money. And that's over an entire career. That's, that's over the course of your entire life at the median. I've heard, yeah, I've heard about like a million people throw around, or at least like when I was in high school getting mm -hmm. ready for college, they threw around that number. It's like, you're going to make a million more dollars if you yeah. go to college. But, but actually, you have a bone to pick with those data because yeah. that is not our generation and that's mm -hmm. certainly not Generation Z either, right? Yeah. I mean, these are people right. for whom the internet did not exist. Yes. So I think, it's, I think it's well, going to be very different. I, yeah, I think you are. You're highlighting a very, I mean, I think a very serious point um, mm -hmm. that we have to consider. We can't even see really how, yeah, how things like the internet mm -hmm. um, affect what yeah. this means. And there is a sure. self-selection aspect to college and 
might even say success in general. The people who have the most ambition, who are the most motivated, right. maybe they're the ones who are more sli- who are most likely to go to universities and college to begin with. Right. In, in in a world in which everybody believes in the obstacle mm-hmm. course, yeah. then the people who uh, are the, the have the most gumption, have the most intelligence, have the most industry, th- they are going to be the ones who finish the obstacle course mm-hmm. and who get the higher earnings. Mm-hmm. And so as compared to the people who, who failed, who, who believed in the obstacle course but failed at it, then of course that there's going to be that discrepancy. But when you consider people who don't believe in the obstacle course, who could have succeeded it mm-hmm. if they if they they ha- had done it, but don't believe in it and went alternate routes, then you you don't you can't expect them to just earn really low wages. Like mm-hmm. I think that they'll Wait, learn more. Here's mm-hmm. my question. This kind of I want to circle back to like how I perceive signaling model as working and as valuable to me um, of what a college mm-hmm. degree means is that it does say, but let's say you do have somebody. Whether or not you believe in the obstacle course, you should be able to complete it, right? I mean, that's the argument. And so they're saying that- If it's valuable. You should should be able to, the college degree signals that however you did it, you achieved that goal. So that could be, you're really good at schmoozing with professors, or you're really good at cheating, or you're really good at finding other, other students who know what they're doing. It's about how you solve this problem and so I think that that's why it, it is it matters to me. Like I see it as important that it's a signaling model. Yeah, yeah. Winning and, that game, yeah. if you choose to play it, is, is a good signal as opposed to losing that game. But is so this the right game? Yeah. So you're saying that is we really shouldn't game? live in a world. You want people to be able to question the game. Yeah. Question the obstacle course. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Well, and so on our sister podcast, Words and Numbers, we actually had a conversation on this recently where. Anthony and James did summarize or, or add the various costs associated with a higher education today. And Dan, you've got some of those numbers on hand. Yeah. So the average four year currently, uh, a- average per year for a four year institution uh, for uh, public, it's $10,000 a year. For private, it's thirty-five thousand dollars. And a year. this is tuition and fees. Mm-hmm. So thirty-five for private schools on average, mm-hmm. and ten for public schools on average. Right. Um, and that's not counting books or anything like that, right? Right. Uh, no, that that is count. Well, that no, that's just tuition and fees. Okay. Yeah. So the average college student is spending several hundred dollars on books each semester. Right. So you have to add that. Uh, but even more importantly, that's not counting opportunity cost, and. The average starting salary that someone could expect Wait, if they went a, right into what's an opportunity cost? Just ah, to, yes. <laughs> so the opportunity cost is what you could have got if you if you hadn't taken Taking, that path. Okay. So so whatever you're doing, whatever you could have been doing otherwise, that's the value that you're talking about. Right. Okay. Whatever you're foregoing, um, and what what a lot of people are foregoing is a starting salary of twenty eight thousand uh, dollars a year. And so when you add that to it, private school uh, attendees are, are paying a quarter of a million dollars for, uh, for their education when you factor in opportunity costs. And public schools are, are paying like uh, $40,000. $40, and that is just a huge, huge investment. And so it's really important to make sure that it's actually worth it. Mm-hmm. So it's $40,000 for the public school plus another 100 or so given the starting salary of a college graduate, right? So you said $250,000 opportunity cost that you'd be missing out on if you went to a private school, but in a public school context, it's the 40 for the tuition and fees plus another 100 or so for the starting salaries that you'd be missing. No, 40 includes the opportunity cost. Oh, it does. Oh, no, I'm total. sorry. I'm sorry. 152 is the okay. Is uh, we, we includes the opportunity cost. Got sorry it. about that. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. So there is, though, a correlation between employment rates and degrees. I mean, you might argue that this is from people who've already graduated. So the impact on Gen Z, it's we can't necessarily say. But for um, a high school diploma, the unemployment rate in 2017 was 4.6, and then that goes down to four four percent for people with diploma with diplomas. So it definitely has an impact. You mm-hmm. could decide for yourself whether or not that's a reason to go or not. Is it causation but, or correlation is yeah. the question at that point. Like, do we yeah. perpetuate the, do we perpetuate the valuing of that or do we kind of try and break free or encourage like mm-hmm. the next generation to break free from, um, honoring the obstacle course? <laughs> yeah. I don't yeah. know. Mm-hmm. 
And so are you happy that you went to college? I mean, is this something that that we're looking back at and yeah. saying, you know, where we are today, this this was a good thing? I just paid my student loan this month. <laughs> but yeah. I think largely I would say yes. However, before I had even graduated, my first my first unpaid internship was at a nonprofit here in here in Atlanta, Georgia, and the work I was doing, I was like, I don't need my college experience for this. I could have done this right out of high school. Right. So in that case, maybe <laughs> not as much. I feel like, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I love like the social component. It, I mean, it did set me up in sort of like to have social skills that I feel like help contribute to my like my professional mm-hmm. success. Um, it also, that's where I discovered economics. Yeah. Um, but I would say that, yeah, I wasn't built for school and I knew that. Like I knew that it was mm-hmm. really, really hard for me to do things like study and go to class. And I it just, it, I was definitely way more built for the working world, like for sure. I, way better at, you know, working in an office um, however that would have looked as a 19 year old, but I definitely was not built for school. And I, I remember knowing that. So I don't know. Yeah. I, I've, I've written a blog post. It's called, uh, I had to escape school to become a scholar. Um, <laughs> it, it, because really that's what happened is that mm. I actually became curious about the world of ideas again. Like my, I, as a little kid before school had kind of drilled it out of me, I was really interested in all sorts of ideas. But then it really wasn't until after I graduated that I started reading the newspaper and I realized I don't have any context to understand these stories. Mm -hmm. And so then I started on my first um, autodidactic journey of teaching myself something. I started diving into history books, just starting from the ancient Sumerians and and working my way forward of just trying to teach myself history so I could just understand the world that I was like entering finally. So you knew how to read the newspaper, but you didn't know how to tell what it meant. Exactly. And that is that is the big question. That's sort of one of the main pieces of value I think that we get from our working lives is we actually get to practice these various things that we only learned in textbooks or on blackboards Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in schooling. And this is the the story that you tell Dan is why you're such a keen proponent of this unschooling movement which yes. is what you were working on uh, learning about the Sumerians by yourself. Exactly. And so obviously everyone's individual mileage will vary. They're mm-hmm. going to find uh, value in school if that's what they're looking for. They're going to find value in beginning their own business. So don't take our stories as, as parables why you shouldn't go to school. But it's worth considering the costs, both from a monetary sense mm-hmm. and from an opportunity cost sense, to know what you could be potentially missing out on. And that's the whole point of this discussion is just sort of thinking critically about what the game of life or the obstacle course that's been set before us actually will do for us in our own lives. Mm -hmm. And so with that, unfortunately, we're out of time. We have to go back down and uh, write more blog posts and stories (laughs) and hold more seminars, educating people about thinking through the economic lens. But we'll see you next week on the FeeCast. For now, enjoy your weekends. (laughs) 